I found that if you look at the very, very first steps which Einstein used in his 1905 paper to introduce the idea of relativity theory, some remarkable uh, uh, things come to light, very surprising things. And <clears throat> to make the story very short, it turns out that in order to um, affect his change, his, his, his relativistic physics, he has to alter the equations of mechanics. Classical physics involves mechanics and electrodynamics. Mechanics goes back to Newton in 1687 and electrodynamics came 178 years later. And Einsteinian physics is tailor-made to electromagnetic theory, but it doesn't really fit the equations of mechanics. So what does Einstein do to justify uh, changing the equations of mechanics? What physical reason does he offer? And actually, when you winnow it down, he doesn't offer any physical reasons at all. Here's what is happening. He refers to the Michelson-Morley experiment of 1887, which was designed to measure for the first time the orbital velocity of the Earth in its conjectured um, orbit around the Sun. And to the great surprise of the physics world, the Michelson-Morley experiment did not detect such a velocity. It, in effect, measured it to be zero. So that was a big problem for the physics world. And in fact, I really surmise this is the fundamental problem the young Albert Einstein wanted to solve and his so-called special theory of relativity of 1905 was his proposed solution. And it involved the idea that A, since this velocity is there, that was his assumption, and since the Michelson-Morley experiment did not measure it, therefore, his so-called principle of special relativity applies. <laughs> and so he saw fit to change the equations of mechanics. And uh, when you now step back and look at, you read his 1905 paper where he outlines his reasoning, and you look at this, you cannot but feel that the reasoning is circular. In other words, he took it for absolutely certain fact that the Earth moves around the Sun at such and such orbital velocity. And since Michaels and Morley did not detect it, ergo principle of relativity. <laughs> In other words, they tried to measure it, they found the velocity of zero, and rather than accept the outcome of that experiment, Einstein decided to reformulate the equations that had served us well since Isaac Newton. That's right. In other words, because the equations of mechanics did not fit his theory, so therefore you change the mechanics. It's a Procrustean solution to the problem. <laughs> the Procrustean. Uh, the, the, the reference there is to a, a wonderful uh, story uh, where Procrustes, whenever anybody got into his bed, if their feet were too long, he'd just hack them off. And get, in that way, he could say, everything fits. You know, every, everything fits. That's the Procrustean solution. That's the Procrustean. So, um, this is how the matter stands on a theoretical basis. Now, in, in, in thinking about this, I came upon a perfectly obvious fact of classical physics, which, however, to my knowledge, no one had ever bothered to spell out. 
Now the fact is this, if you have a reference frame K0, let us say, and in, with respect to this reference frame, the equations of physics, mechanics plus electrodynamics hold. And if you then find another reference frame K in which this is likewise the case, then it follows that K is stationary with respect to K0. That's, that's, that's profound, yes. <laughs> the amazing thing is that it is so obvious and I don't remember anyone uh, ever uh, pointing this out and giving it a name. I call it the principle of immobility. And it's a remarkable fact, namely our equations of physics, classical physics, actually define a notion of stationary reference frame. The idea of the stationary is there implicit in our physics. And so uh, Einstein, of course, knew this very well, and, but it couldn't accept it. Uh, we'll talk about this in a moment. Why, why didn't he want to accept this? And so he introduced his principle of relativity in order to deny the principle of immobility. So when I recognized this, I was quite amazed and I asked myself the natural question, what, what is it about this principle of immobility which offends Albert Einstein? Why is he so dead set against it? When actually we know it down, there are no empirical facts which contradict it. That's right. It's not like we, we the problem that we faced was that the Michelson-Morley experiment was supposed to yield a 30 kilometer per second motion, and it didn't. That was the problem. So you can either ad adjust your assumptions about that orbit, or you can rewrite the equations <laughs> for physics uh, yeah. to, to fit yeah. a theory that explains it away. I mean, to uh, find fault with the Michelson-Morley experiment, it's like shooting the messenger. <laughs> uh, I mean, they measured something, the verdict was in, and they don't accept it. They say something strange must be happening because we know the Earth moves. In any case, um, I, thinking about this, I realized that there is a very close connection between what I call the principle of immobility, the fact that physics, classical physics, singles out the so-called stationary reference frame, and geocentrism. There's that dreaded uh, G word again. There is just one detail that needs to be uh, resolved. Um, it is generally believed that the Earth rotates around its polar axis uh, every 24 hours. And therefore, from this point of view, it cannot be regarded as stationary. But it so happens that a physicist by the name of Ernst Mach came up with a principle known as Mach's principle. Incidentally, that's Einstein's uh, designation. He Isn't called it Mach's principle. <laughs> and uh, he was very inspired by it. And I think uh, his general theory of relativity was um, to some degree motivated by that. But what, what Mach's principle, principle tells us is that you cannot really distinguish empirically by means of experiment whether the Earth is rotating and the cosmos is at rest or whether it's the other way around. There's no conceivable way of putting this to the experimental test. To, so in other words, one is at liberty to take the, the, the geocentric reference frame as being at rest. And now when you combine this with the principle of Im immobility, you find that um, classical physics combined with Mach's principle gives you geocentrism. And once I recognized this, it was quite clear to me why uh, Albert Einstein was 
so eager to reject this principle of immobility or not even to name it, not even to explicitly point out what it is that classical physics really has to say on this question. And so I realized that um, it is the antagonism towards geocentrism that stands behind the whole phenomenon of relativistic physics. And it reminded me of a very interesting thing that a scientist by the name of Richard Levontin said. He, he wrote somewhere, speaking for the scientists, he said, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. And I, I really feel that hits the nail on the head because uh, if you speak about geocentrism, if you speak about the idea of the earth being at rest and defining rest, you, what is implicit in this idea is the, uh, the notion of design. So, so there's, there's design in the universe. And design obviously entails a designer. So uh, I came finally to the conclusion that relativistic physics is based, strictly speaking, not on empirical evidence, on strictly scientific considerations, but at bottom it is ideological. And the ideology is contra uh, the idea that the world was designed by God.